It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here today. Uh, it's been a long time, but we have really been working on this lecture series traveling throughout history. So you are welcome to this one. This is our kickoff. And we have an exciting program for you today. But uh, let me first thank the bank, the first bank of Alabama for sponsoring these programs. And uh, Chris Kramer is here and will accept any gratuities or smiles or handshakes or whatever else is on the menu. And then as you run across these people, please convey the appreciation to them for this gift that they're giving us of this lecture series. I'm just thrilled today to have Dr. Matthew Browns to address this group. Uh, we're thrilled to have him with time and talent and enrichment. And one of the interesting things about this is he's going to talk about one of the great success stories in the state of Alabama. He's Matthew Downs. Dr. Downs is the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences and Associate Professor of History. He received his PhD from the University of Alabama in 2010. And uh, the beautiful thing that he's done is the, he is the author of the book, Transforming the South, Federal Development of the Tennessee Valley. And any of you are interested in industrial development and bringing new business and industry, uh, he's the authority on it because he's worked on both ends of it. He was raised and lived in Decatur, and then he went to Mobile to work, and then back to uh, the North Alabama to do his research. He's the co-editor of the American South in the Great War, 1914 and 24. So, Matthew, if that uh, goes real well, we'll be talking to you again and get to the full story of World War One. He currently serves as editor of the Alabama Review, which is a quarterly uh, program where they take all things historical and put them together and send, send them back out in the booklet. Uh, he lives in Daphne with his wife and his children, so turn off your cell phones and let's enjoy Dr. Matthew Downs with the story of the Tennessee Valley Authority. Matthew, welcome to Sylacauga. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I know we're not, we're in Alabama power territory, but, we'll, but I'll be kind. I'll be real kind about it. Um, so when we think of the Tennessee Valley Authority, the TVA, we think about dams. Some of you may have visited a TVA dam. Some of you, if you're avid boaters, you may have traveled down the Tennessee River, which looks very different today than it did before the TVA showed up. You know that those dams create, they back up the river. You know that they create electric power. They uh, they create that hydroelectricity. You may know that TVA owns and operates coal, gas, solar, wind, nuclear power plants now. All of it contributes to this massive electrical output that feeds homes and businesses through almost every inch of Tennessee, as well as parts of Kentucky, Mississippi, North Carolina, Georgia, Alabama, though not quite here to Sylacauga. But TVA is so much more than dams. And I think thinking about TVA as a series of dams on a river misses what TVA did and what TVA was able to accomplish. Because TVA was a lifeline. It was a source of immediate economic relief during this long endemic depression. But it was also this profound rethinking of the Southern economy, what the economy could be, and then specifically what the federal government could do for the Southern economy. And so that's what I want to talk a little bit about today, that larger impact of TVA. Uh, I'll do it in three stages. I want to first talk a little bit about poverty in North Alabama, particularly, but it's broadly applicable. This was the problem that TVA was supposed to fix. Then I want to talk about the kind of immediate application of TVA. What did TVA do when it showed up in the, in the 1930s? And then I want to think how TVA began to make this pivot, this change towards what we would call industrial development, which if you know anything about TVA is effectively what TVA does now. TVA is a development organization that also operates some dams. So we'll, we'll see if we can hash some of that out. 
let me start with a map. I tried to find a good map of the Tennessee Valley, and so I think it's probably best if we talk about that first. You'll note that the Tennessee Valley, or what we call the valley, is effectively the area washed by the Tennessee River. The Tennessee River through, the, through 1930 was a wild river. It was a mountain river. It, came, it comes down out of the Appalachian Mountains. You can see that it kind of sweeps down along the border of Tennessee and Georgia. It dips down into Alabama. This is sometimes called the Great Bend. And then it cuts back up. It catches that very corner of northern Mississippi, eventually goes back up through Tennessee, goes up into Kentucky, and empties into the Ohio right before the Ohio empties into the Mississippi. Parts of the Tennessee River were deep, but a lot of it was extremely shallow. A lot of it was so shallow, boats could not pass over. And there were lots of efforts in different parts of the river to get boats around shoals and shallow parts. The river was also wild in that it flooded all the time. You can find lots of pictures of Chattanooga and other cities like that that were on the river that are underwater because the, TV was, the, the, Tennessee, Val the Tennessee River was unregulated. When I talk about the Tennessee Valley, I focus mostly on Alabama. That was an area of my interest. And so when I talk about the valley, I'm mostly talking about North Alabama. But in general, the things that we talk about are broadly applicable. And if you have questions about Tennessee or Georgia or North Carolina, I can probably talk to you about them as well. But let me start with this. Let me start with poverty and what poverty looked like in this part of the world around 1930. As late as 1930, the South was an overwhelmingly agricultural region. Acres and acres of farmland only occasionally broken up by what economic historians called extractive industries. Things like timber processing, textile mills, and then in a few scattered areas, some steel mills, some port facilities. The Tennessee Valley was no exception. Most of the inhabitants of the valley were farmers. And most of them were trying to grow two crops cotton and corn, because these were the crops, that, the crops that made money. They were cash crops. But commodity prices peaked after World War I, and beginning around 1920, cotton in particular was, went into a steady fall. This price collapse was difficult if you were a farmer, but for some valley residents, tenants, sharecroppers who didn't own the land they worked, and instead either paid rent or worked for a partial share of the crop, the collapse of cotton was devastating. Now, land ownership in the Tennessee Valley wasn't as imbalanced as in parts of the Black Belt, but nearly half of the farmers in the entire Tennessee, Tennessee Valley were non-owners. They were in some sort of dependent relationship with a landowner. And the number was really high where that river dips into Alabama. TVA statistics said that in that part, tenancy, tenancy, tenancy and sharecropping reached something like 60%. Now, if you are a tenant or a sharecropper, the price of cotton is your lifeblood. And just a few cents is the difference between a profit at the end of the year and a debt that will keep you on the land working to pay off the debt in addition to the additional debt that you rack up. By the mid to late 1920s, even some people who owned their land were finding that they, could, they couldn't keep up with other parts of the necessity of farming, and so they were falling into debt. TVA's own analysis showed that by the 1930s, valley farmers were planting more and more and more crops. They were borrowing more and more money for seed and equipment, but also for fertilizer only to not make enough money to pay off those debts and then fall into more debt. Tenants, sharecroppers, or what was always the most drastic approach, leave farming altogether. It tells us that in the Tennessee Valley, like most of the South, the Great Depression began almost immediately after World War I, and it crept along through the 1920s, even when the rest of the country was roaring and humming along. So it was bad on the farm, but there were very few alternatives. If you had made the decision, all right, farming is not for me, I'm in debt, I can't get out, I'll go find a job, there weren't jobs in the Tennessee Valley. Really, the only place that saw any sort of real alternative was a place like Huntsville. In the early part of the century, Huntsville boasted a series of textile mills. Textile mills had always been this alternative. If you couldn't make it on the farm or you couldn't get out of debt, you decided to do something else, make an extra paycheck. 
But when economic straits hit the valley in the 1920s, the mills got hit as well. They had to cut back production. They had to scale back wages. One writer wrote that in the 1920s, Huntsville's mills, quote, collapsed like a deck of cards. And so there was almost no solution to poverty on the ground in the valley. So what is the solution? What, what could you do? Well, local leaders and their collaborators in the state government, casting about for a solution, settled on Muscle Shoals. Muscle Shoals, Alabama, up in the northwestern corner of the state. Muscle Shoals had hosted, during World War I, a nitrate facility, a nitrate-producing facility, that was designed, at least during the war, to make nitrates to be used for munitions. One of the other benefits was that during peacetime, nitrates are also useful as fertilizer. So there was this sense that there would be this factory in Muscle Shoals making this very valuable material. But the war was very brief. It only operated for a couple of months when the war was ongoing. And as early as like 1919, 1920, the facility was shuttered and vacant. The facility also had a dam, a hydroelectric dam that had been built to power the factory. It would eventually be known as Wilson Dam. But because the site was shuttered, it sat vacant. And a lot of local leaders said this could be our solution, a factory that puts people to work, a factory that makes fertilizer that we could distribute to farmers to help them grow more crops, if only someone would be interested. Most Alabamians were no, not interested in a government facility, at least at first, so they turned to a number of private in individuals to maybe use that factory. The most popular option was Henry Ford, the very same Henry Ford that made cars. For a brief period of time, Henry Ford had some interest in Muscle Shoals and promised to make it the center of this industrial uh, industrial, new industrial heartland, but it fell through. So that by the end of the 1920s, Muscle Shoals was this promise. If only something could be done, if only we could get someone interested in this facility, we might could turn things around. It was especially true for people in the valley. It's right next door. Could this be the solution? And by the 1930s, they were desperate. If they couldn't find a private individual or a private company to be interested in Muscle Shoals, Maybe, swallow your pride, we'll turn to the federal government. And into that stepped that fellow right there, Franklin Roosevelt. From the outset, Roosevelt's plan for the Depression, his solution, the New Deal, was revolutionary. He built on populist and progressive ideas about economic recovery and reform. He would inject money into the economy through public works. He would use the federal government to encourage industry and agriculture to adopt new policies. He would support worker organization and unionization. He would provide economic security for those passed over by prosperity. TVA was part of this revolution. TVA was part of this very first initial brunt of New Deal programs designed very specifically to address the Depression. You've heard of the first 100 days. TVA was part of that first 100 days. It was a broad program of changes that focused on one region, the Tennessee Valley, and at least at first centered on that one facility, that nitrate facility at Muscle Shoals. Take what had started there and mirror it all over the place. So what would it do? TVA would build a series of hydroelectric dams to tame the Tennessee River. The dams would back up water. The water would get deeper over the shallow places so that navigation could come down the river. But the dams would also routinely release the water, which would turn through turbines and produce hydroelectricity that TVA would then deliver to consumers. Those dams would also control flooding because now the river could be regulated. You get a lot of rain, you let more water through. You don't get a lot of rain, you keep the water back. But not only would power go to individuals, it would go to farms. Farmers could get appliances. They could power the barn. Not only would it go to farms, it would go to businesses. New industries could come into the Tennessee Valley because now there was power available. 
for them. But TVA went even further. Some of this land is going to be bought up to build the reservoirs and the dams. TVA would relocate people to new places, maybe to new land that they had never been able to own before, maybe to land that is now available for them to farm. TVA would combat malaria. TVA would send social workers into the Tennessee Valley to investigate poverty, to see what poverty looked like on the ground. And officials would work with communities to attract business. The program was designed for, and this was in the words of the actual piece of legislation creating TVA, the, quote, agricultural and industrial development of the valley. It was everything. We can't talk about everything. We would be here hours and hours and hours. But I do think if we start talking about what it was like to build the dam and what it looks like to try and plan for a dam on the ground, we will get a sense of what TVA did, but also what that poverty looked like in those areas where it worked. So let's talk about one dam. Let's talk about Wheeler Dam. In October of 1933, about five months after TVA was created, Congress allocated $7 million to construct Wheeler Dam. It would be located on the river, just kind of downriver from the city of Decatur. If you're thinking between about Decatur and Florence, you're in the right direction. TVA knew that the minute they built this dam, the dam would back water up. And so in order to prepare for the dam, TVA had to clear land. They had to move anybody whose land was in remote proximity to that floodplain. And so TVA eventually purchased about 100,000 acres in Limestone and Morgan counties. And because TVA was so deliberate in doing so, because they were sending social workers into the valley, TVA kept meticulous records of the people they, they had to remove. And so I can give you a snapshot of what it looked like in this one place, the Wheeler Reservoir. There were about 835 families living there. The mixture was about half white, half black. Of those 835 people, of 835 families, excuse me, 700 of them were farm families. Of those 700 families, 50 owned their land. The rest of them were some sort of what we might call a marginal farmer. You were either a renter on someone else's land, or you were a sharecropper, working the land in order for a small share of the crop. But TVA went further. They knew that there's probably not going to be an option for all of these people to stay in farming. So TVA asked them, like, what are your prospects? What's the chance that you could do anything besides farming? Here's what TVA learned. Of those families, almost every single child was below grade level. Of those families, only 2% of the adults had a high school education. Of those families, 33 people had any sort of industrial work experience, period. But when TVA asked them, what do you want to do? What do you see yourself doing once we move you to a new place? Almost every single one of those families said, we're farmers and we want to be farmers. And because TVA was moving them from their land, TVA, they expected TVA to find them land to move to. So you imagine the magnitude of this problem. These are farmers. They can't imagine a future that is not farming. They don't have what we would think of as the skills to move into an alternative to farming. But it's almost certain that that over-reliance on farming period was what contributed to this endemic poverty. How do you fix this? It's going to get worse. So TVA starts buying up land parcels. And when TVA does, they begin paying people for that property, right? TVA buys your land, eminent domain, we know the government can do this. But here was a problem. Only 50 of those families owned their land. Those 50 got a check for the land. TVA hoped that if you were a landowner, you would turn around and then equally distribute the money out to the people affected by removal. You know where this is going, I think. <laughs> yeah, I think you know. TVA had no mechanism to enforce this. They basically had to say, here is your check for your 1,000 acres. 
please take care of your tenants for us. And TVA, could, TVA did follow up. They couldn't control what happened. TVA, to its great credit, did its best. It would contact the tenant and sharecropping families and then refer them to other New Deal agencies. Maybe you can go work with the CCC. Maybe we can find you a public works program. The agency worked with state and local relief agencies. You can imagine how well they were doing during the Great Depression. In some cases, TVA would do these very informal things. I saw one story when I was doing my research of a family who were renters. Actually, I think they were, they were actually basically squatters on land. TVA convinced the owner to hold a kind of sham auction and then sell another property of land for like a dollar to the guy, but it was completely informal. And you can't do that 800 times over and over again. To be fair, too, TVA created jobs. Thousands of residents in the valley found work clearing the land that would be flooded, building the dam, working in TVA facilities. Every one of those jobs paid real wages, federal wages, not Alabama wages. And those wages went to workers and their families, and it trickled back down into the economy. We should also note that TVA made a concerted effort to hire black workers. Many of the people displaced from Wheeler Reservoir and other reservoirs were African American. TVA tried to hire them. They hired them in what was called proportional hiring, meaning they tried to hire proportional to the population. But the jobs were segregated. And in many cases, African American workers were given the most temporary jobs, the land clearing jobs, the jobs that disappeared once the land was cleared and the water started showing up. And that was a bigger problem for TVA's jobs. They were temporary. Most of them lasted only during construction. Once the dam was completed, if you didn't get a job at the dam and you couldn't find a job in the facilities running the dam, you had to find something else. But now your old farm is under a lake and there is less land in the area, right? 100,000 acres are now gone. And so there are more people looking for land in an area that has less of it. Now, in public, TVA's PR people were very good. They claimed that most residents had willingly moved from TVA land, and that, that's, that's true. They noted that there were jobs and opportunities created, not least of which was electricity coming into a place that had not really been electrified. But in their internal documents, officials were pessimistic. In its report on Wheeler, TVA noted that the dam had actually worsened the situation in the short run, quote, taking thousands of acres of fertile land out of production, causing families to relocate in an overpopulated area. Clearly, there had to be a bigger solution. The solution was a more diversified economy. But because families didn't have the resources or experience to jump into that industrial work, someone would have to help. And it's here where we have to expand our scope. Because TVA became that person. TVA became that agency to help diversify the economy, and how they did it is really interesting. So let's talk about the government of TVA. TVA was a federal agency. It had a board of directors. At least at first, in kind of the mid to late 1930s, the driving force of TVA was its first chairman, that guy right there in the middle, Arthur E. Morgan. Morgan is a fascinating fellow. He was an Ohio engineer who, at the time he was tapped to lead TVA, was a college president. He was actually the president of a school in Ohio called Antioch. And as president, Morgan had done something radical. He had made it so that the school didn't really charge tuition. Instead, if you went to the school, you had to work for the school. You had to work on the school farm. You had to work in the school facilities. You had to cook the food. And as you worked in the school, you got your education. It was effectively, we might call it, self-supporting. And this is, was his vision for TVA. He says, I want to take this and do it in that valley. As he told a group at Muscle Shoals in the early days of TVA, I want to, quote, teach the American people in rural communities how to live. 
He argued that the problem in the South was something he called rugged individualism. This idea that every person had to make as much money as possible, and the best way to do that is to grow cotton. Who cares what it does to the environment? Who cares what it does to my neighbor? Who cares what it does to overflowing the market with cotton? I have to make money. He said, instead, we should teach them to live together, to work as a community. It was communalism. The idea that TVA would encourage sustainable farming. It would develop industries, but industries based on like crafts and home good production. It would bring in education and training. You would grow something and then give it to your neighbor who would make something and give it to you, and then you would get trained to do this other thing for your other neighbor. His son, interviewed about what his dad was doing, called it human engineering, changing the way people live. You have probably figured out by now that it didn't work. It's a a bit rosy. But I don't think we should immediately dismiss it because it speaks to that initial excitement, that initial idealism that came with the New Deal. Anything is possible. Who knows what we can do to solve economic problems? And actually, Morgan got a chance to try it out. For another dam up the river near Knoxville, Norris Dam, which was built under his oversight as chairman, he actually created the town that went along with the dam, that had housed the initial workers. It became Norris, Tennessee. And Norris was about as close as his vision got. It had houses for workers and their families. The town had recreation centers with ping pong tables. It had training programs where any individual could go to learn new skills. Want to learn drafting? There's a town center for this. Just go and Go and, go and learn something new. Planned communal activities. Morgan was a micromanager. He even said, okay, on the street leading into the town, the road coming in, no billboards. A beautiful community. And, of course, the town was electrified with TVA power. We should also note that, at least at first, Roosevelt was not opposed to this idea. Because Roosevelt also believed that the way the South was working was not working. That the Depression had shown the failure of the South's reliance on a cash crop economy. And some of his initial pronouncements kind of catch, would catch our ear in the same way. In November of 1934, Roosevelt said, with TVA, power is really a secondary matter. What we are doing there is taking a watershed with about three and a half million people in it, and we are trying to make a different type of citizen out of them. Even Roosevelt sounds like he might be on board with some of that human engineering. But we know that in his heart, that's not what Roosevelt wanted. Roosevelt had one goal, solve the Depression. Now, he did believe that there would have to be some basic changes to the American economy to do so, but as historians will tell you, Roosevelt was not trying to undo capitalism. He was trying to make capitalism work more efficiently. Morgan is undoing capitalism. He's creating something more like communalism. And so over time, as it became clear that there might be a solution to this problem, Roosevelt's vision for TVA began to more closely meet one of Morgan's colleagues and the person who I think became the leading voice for TVA, the person who I think more than anyone else reshaped TVA into what it became, one of the other initial uh, board members of TVA, David Lilienthal. Lilienthal is over there on the far side from me. Lilienthal was a lawyer, a young lawyer, whose main interest was public utilities, defending the right of government entities to generate and sell power. As you note, then, he was a perfect fit for TVA. And Lilienthal His vision of public utilities, of power, was industry. The best thing a city, a state, a government can do is make electricity that powers industries because those industries could work on two levels. Industries employ individuals with good jobs who make money, but industries also attract money into a community. If TVA can generate cheap power, it will sell that power to industries who will locate in the Tennessee Valley. They will consume that energy and employ Southerners. 
who will then make money. And as they make money, they will buy stuff and more industries will come in. Lilienthal's vision was a different way of addressing the problem of the South, of that endemic reliance on cash crop. He promised that TVA would make the Tennessee Valley, quote, the scene of an expansion of industry which in the course of the coming decade will change the economic life of the South. Roosevelt liked this. This is a real solution. We make power. We sell the power to industry. Industry comes in and creates jobs. Morgan's communal, self-sufficient town, it would benefit individual residents. Lilienthal's customers would revitalize the American economy. And that's what Roosevelt liked. And Lilienthal had supporters. In the cities of the Tennessee Valley, in Florence, in Huntsville, in Decatur, in Athens, leaders immediately saw this benefit. If we can get this cheap, government-subsidized electricity, we can attract companies. Those companies will come into our city. We'll give them land. We'll give them tax breaks. We will jumpstart industrialization. And there is one city that I think captured this perfectly, and that is Decatur. There, locals, most notably the editor of the Decatur Daily, Barrett Shelton, went directly to Lilienthal. And he said, Lilienthal, I like, I like what you're saying. Would you help us market Decatur to businesses? Lilienthal said, oh, yes, no problem. He sent TVA staff to Decatur. They wrote up how much waterfront land Decatur had. They wrote opportunities for port facilities and factories, how many workers uh, Decatur could attract, and created a catalog that Decatur then used to send to industries and to sell Decatur to them. Moreover, Lilienthal sent advisors who said, here's what you could do in city government. Here's some zoning laws that would be very effective for you. You should create a chamber of commerce to really help give the business community voice. Decatur did all this. Leading up to World War II, Decatur had landed a shipbuilding plant, an aluminum facility, a grain processing plant. In a place that had no industry, this was remarkable progress. You can also then imagine what life was like in the TVA boardroom. You've got Morgan. You've got this, this idealistic vision of self-sufficient communities. And then you got Lilienthal bringing in business. They hated each other. They argued with each other all the time. Roosevelt was the parent, right? If you have kids, you know what happens. <laughs> Mommy, that sort of thing. That was Roosevelt. Roosevelt, he just said this to me. Roosevelt, we want to do this. But Roosevelt, and he slided more and more over to Lilienthal. This fight was compounded by another fight that happened at the same time, one between TVA and other utilities in the South. This conflict, the power fight, effectively boosted Lilienthal into power, so we have to talk about it. It also involves Alabama power, so we might be interested here. So, brief sidetrack. In any comparison with TVA, Alabama power is going to get a bad rap which I think is unfair. Because Alabama power into the 1920s had been working to electrify Alabama. It had made strides towards rural electrification. It had actually at one point even considered taking over that Muscle Shoals facility and helping out the valley. But Alabama power was a private company. It answered to stockholders. And it always had to balance service with profit. It costs money to generate electricity. It costs money to run power lines into areas. And Alabama Power had to have a guarantee that when it ran power lines into a rural area, it would make money on those lines. And so in a place like the Tennessee Valley that was impoverished, where if you were any sort of businessman, you would never expect those people to be able to consistently pay for a utility, it didn't make a lot of sense to run a bunch of lines. Alabama Power had run some, but not much. And so it had a very small footprint in the region. And then in came TVA, which changed the calculus. TVA did not have to consider profit. TVA was government subsidized. TVA's job was to electrify rural areas. So TVA ran lines. TVA gave power. It sold power at a much reduced cost. Alabama Power was furious. And in fact, a group of stockholders of Alabama Power sued the federal government to stop, arguing that the federal government 
was constitutionally ineligible for selling electricity. It was one of the landmark cases of the New Deal. It was called Ashwander v. TVA. Ashwander was the alphabetically first of the Alabama power stock, stockholders. But the Supreme Court upheld Roosevelt's agency. The Supreme Court said that a river is a natural resource and that it is a legitimate use of the government's stewardship of a natural resource to generate electricity from it. And the person who was up front every day making these arguments was David Lilienthal, arguing for power, arguing that power was the solution to the Depression, arguing that any attempt to stop the spread of power would be to limit the South and to limit the South's economic growth. When TVA won, Lilienthal's star was ascendant, and Morgan fumed. He argued all the time. He claimed that focusing on power and bringing in industry was limiting what TVA could do. It was limiting the change that could happen, but Lilienthal had won. Power was the center of what TVA was doing. Soon after the court case, TVA worked out an agreement with companies like Alabama Power. They effectively took out a map. They drew a line. Above that line is TVA customers. Below it, Alabama Power customers. They made deals on power lines and generating and, and um, distribution facilities. And Morgan lost. In 1938, Roosevelt dismissed Arthur Morgan for what he called, quote-unquote, obstruction and praised David Lilienthal for the work he had done. On the eve of World War II then, TVA was ready to use power to attract industry. And Lilienthal was ready. Lilienthal, um, in the late 1930s, came to Mobile and he gave a speech that he called New Industries for a New South. He said the South was ready for industrialization. New factories would bring new jobs, wages that Southerners would use to, put, to purchase goods, it would bring in business. And TVA was a partner in that process. TVA would train, quote, men and institutions that can grow and develop to meet the very great, almost overwhelming opportunities and problems of sound industrial development. And at about the same time, Franklin Roosevelt talked about the need for the United States to be an arsenal for democracy, to build the goods and weapons and other equipment that could be used to win a war for democracy. Lilienthal and Roosevelt's visions were beginning to overlap. And for Lilienthal, it was the perfect opportunity to sell TVA as, a, as an electricity producer for industry. And he wanted the Tennessee Valley to be at the forefront of this defense boom. TVA would make power. TVA, a federal agency, would find it very easy to give power to defense industries, to federal government agencies that needed it. As he told Valley leaders, quote, growth of industry in the South has been inevitable. Now the South is ready. And again, there is an excellent example of this in Huntsville. The old dying mill town was square in the reach of TVA's hydroelectric power. And so TVA began working with, Al with Alabama's congressional delegation, Lister Hill, John Sparkman. They started lobbying the Army. The Army agreed to locate a chemical warfare arsenal in Huntsville, eventually becoming Redstone Arsenal. Part of that agreement to locate Redstone Arsenal in Huntsville was that Huntsville had TVA power that the government could give at cost. You can't compete with that in a place that's served by private industry, by private utilities. And we know what it's done for Huntsville. Redstone Arsenal transitioned into the post-war years as the missile facility for the Army. It brought in Werner von Braun. It added a space flight center. Every one of those engineers and line workers who came to Huntsville spent their money in Huntsville, which brought in other companies and stores. Huntsville boomed. This was Lilienthal's vision in action, TVA generating economic growth. It did something else, too. It convinced locals in Alabama that TVA was a partner, that it was a partner to help them get what they wanted, which was economic development. And so beginning in the 1940s and stretching through the 1950s and really beyond, this became TVA's work go into places in the Tennessee Valley, and eventually a little broader, and start working with local leaders, 
help them think of ways to sell TVA power as a way to bring in industry. Think of ways to use TVA as the selling point. Again, Decatur is a perfect example. After World War II, Decatur told TVA, we want to keep going, please help us. So TVA came back to Decatur. They created a catalog of waterfront real estate. Some of the real estate that TVA had purchased in order to buy up the land for, Wilson, for Wheeler Dam. TVA, after World War II, pulled out industrial sites. They took a map and drew this site. Here's plot A for your industry. TVA extended city services, helped Decatur figure out how to run electrical lines and sewage pipes into these industrial areas. TVA even went so far to send in accountants who could draw up cost plans for a lot of these businesses. And then pretty soon, Decatur started bringing in business. They brought in Monsanto. They brought in 3M. By the end of the 1950s, people were referring to Decatur's riverfront as the Gold Coast with something like $65 million of industrial investment, thousands of industrial jobs, and in the words of editor Barrett Shelton, a spirit that would help civic leaders continue to bring in investment. And census numbers tell us what a transformation this was. By 1960, Morgan County, which is where Decatur is located, had three times as many industrial workers as farmers. That's 30 years from an area in which only 30 out of 800, 800 families had any industrial work experience to a county in where there were three times as many industrial workers as farmers. And that idea that TV is a partner, that the federal government is a partner for growth, is very important. This is not the TVA of Arthur Morgan. TVA is not coming in telling people, make this craft and trade it with your neighbor. They're bringing industry. And they're bringing in those industrial jobs. TVA had a profound and long-term effect on the people of the Tennessee Valley. It tamed the river. It built dams that generated electrical power. It encouraged reforms in farming and land use practices. It eradicated malaria. It addressed rural poverty. But it also encouraged Southerners in the valley and increasingly outside the valley to think what the Southern economy could be, how to use cheap power and government resources to attract businesses that would bring in new jobs and new revenue. From the outset, guys like David Lilienthal saw this as a partnership. We do stuff for you, you do stuff for us, what they called a democratic labor. TVA gives you the means to advertise your resources, gives you the means to produce incentives. You woo the clients. And increasingly, TVA did this at the state level. TVA had a technician that came and worked with the Alabama state government. You know as well as I do that Alabama took those things and applied them in other places that weren't getting TVA power. A lot of these ideas were applicable. Now, obviously, much has changed for TVA since the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s. TVA has branched into new forms of power, most notably nuclear. You may also have seen that TVA has been in the news trying to deal with some of the long-term environmental impact of how it uses land, of how it generates power, especially with coal plants. We didn't talk about it, but also in the 1950s, TVA reshaped how the board worked and how funding worked so that much of TVA is now self-funded. A lot of their programs, they pay for with the money they get for generating electricity. But that also makes them have an incentive to turn a profit. But a lot of it is unchanged. TVA still operates hydroelectric dams that provide power for residential and commercial customers. TVA works very closely with state and local leaders to attract businesses that will then use TVA power. In fact, TVA helped Chattanooga locate a Volkswagen assembly plant. TVA helped North Mississippi locate a Toyota assembly plant. And most recently, TVA helped Huntsville and Athens locate a Mazda Toyota plant into the valley. TVA routinely, on its website, lists sites of industrial development and is perfectly willing to help communities locate industries to those. We don't think of this as a legacy of the New Deal and a legacy of programs to solve the Depression, but it is very much that. When we think of dams, well, of TVA, we think of dams and the river and electricity, 
I think we should also think of the economy and the way that the southern economy modernized and the way that TVA continues to shape how the Tennessee Valley and Alabama and the South does business. Thank you very much. We have a few minutes for some question and answer. Thank you for that wonderful program. Do we have some questions? And he's going to repeat your question just so we make sure to get it on the recording. So he asked, is TVA still government subsidized and subsidized and are utility rates lower? The answer to the first question is not really. So during the 1950s, there was a lot of skepticism about government. Dwight Eisenhower, Dwight Eisenhower actually called TVA creeping socialism. But so TVA went through a process by which they don't get the big subsidies from Congress anymore. They're allowed to pull revenue out of the valley and then use that to fund programs. So they are not as subsidized, but they still get some government assistance and their power is still cheaper. I, and this is, now this is hearsay. I think of my power, which is Alabama power down in Mobile. And then I look at my parents' bill up in Athens. There's a little cheaper up there. <laughs> mm, yeah, sure. Alabama and Georgia and Tennessee and I was I was they couldn't contend with me because I was everywhere so they had to send me back home to my grandparents I had to be raised by four adults and I tell you that's an education on top and I couldn't understand why my folks had thrown me away they they came home about once every two months and they get wire and they get they pick up stuff they had to have for the job my mother would love on me a little bit. And she said, honey, we got to go. And, uh, my, you know, that's what happened. But my mother was really small. She weighed about 90 plus pounds. And the homes that they worked in was couldn't hold my daddy because he weighed like 185. Mm -hmm. So she was the little rabbit that went up in the attic and all those other places and strung the wire. And I asked mother, I said, what exactly did they want? And she said, they wanted a front porch light. And they wanted a light in the sitting room, and the woman wanted a light in the kitchen. <laughs> so they put three lights in the houses yeah. that they wired, and they would go into a community and light it, light up that one house, and they'd go on to another place. And before they got too far, those people were saying, we want what they got. So that's what happened to those little people that you mm -hmm. were talking about, mm -hmm. the poor people that were in the areas, they did benefit from yes, TVA. Well, I think about two things, talking about the benefits of TVA. I think about my grandfather, who was a farmer, what we would have called a dirt farmer, who after World War II came home and had a job in Decatur, which he would not have had without TVA. He worked at John Blue, which was like a farm equipment company. And it, was, it allowed him, it actually allowed him to keep farming because then he could farm at nights and the weekends but he could do so because he had a real income and he was not trapped in these cycles of debt. I also think about what I think is one of the most ingenious programs TVA had, which is that TVA realized early on that one of the best ways to convince families to agree to wire their houses was to sell them appliances. And so TVA would bring in appliances to communities and then they would sell you the washing machine. And then you would be like, well, I do want a washing machine. I really hate doing it by hand. I guess I'll get electricity so that I can have a washing machine. And then, oh, your neighbor also has a refrigerator. That thing looks pretty nice as well. It's a real ingenious way to convince people to buy electricities, to sell them appliances, I thought. Any more questions? Right here. So I'm not 100% sure. Um, that's a little beyond my kind of study of TVA. 
But TVA ran into some nuclear issues in the 1970s and 1980s. Of course, Three Mile Island made a lot of people very skeptical of the safety of nuclear power. And then TVA, I don't know, I can't remember the exact years, but TVA also had a bit of a scare up at their nuclear power plant at Browns Ferry, which is up in Limestone County. And so I think there was a kind of a, a skeptical turning against nuclear power and the idea that nobody wants to live near Three Mile Island, right, if you can be there. And then TVA had these other systems in place. TVA had coal generating plants, and so they had other ways of powering electricity, and so they didn't need the nuclear plants. Uh, they, they, I think they were planning on destroying it, but I'm not sure if it's still there or not. I think it's, it's not, you're right, it's not operating, I know that. Oh, really? For a while, you could drive up past it, and you could still see the big cooling towers. And those are, but it's, it's real creepy looking. Yeah, okay. They do, they have, wind, they have some wind facilities as well. Yeah, so they are, TVA is branching out into other Methods of generating power, that's true. I can. So, t so they were trying to lease the plant. Henry Ford was interested. Henry Ford claimed that if they would sell it to him, he would build, he said he would build an industrial city that stretched from Florence to Huntsville, which was like 100 miles, uh, he, uh, like a new Detroit. But Ford... Because Ford was private industry, there were a number of individuals in Congress, particularly Frank Norris. Frank Norris was kind of a progressive conservationist who was terrified that Ford would waste the facilities, that he would come in, he would, he would like remake it, he would squander the money, and that the government was effectively giving them this federal project that he would just use for profit and waste. And so any time any legislation came up to sell t the facilities to a private individual, so that was Henry Ford, that was also Alabama Power, the same thing happened to them, the Norris and his block in the federal government shut it down. Mm. He, he, that, it's, a real, it's a fascinating thing. One of the really interesting parts of that is that when it, when it was news that, that Henry Ford was interested, people in that area, they went crazy. They were like, this is it. The South is going to be revitalized. People flooded in and, and built subdivisions. Property values in like Florence and Muscle Shoals skyrocketed. If you've ever been to Florence, there are, there are kind of streets that go nowhere, and there are blocked out subdivisions that just never panned out. But from that initial kind of boom and excitement of Ford coming in to the collapse when it was clear he couldn't get it. So it's, it's fascinating. Any more questions? Okay, Dr. Downs, thank you so much. You. I love when question and answer is not scary because they know their subject so well. So thank you so much for the program and for driving up today oh, to be with us. No problem. Hope we get to have you back again. Yeah, of course. Thank you all so much for coming today. Thank you all so much for coming. It's so good to see your faces again. When we take our hiatus from Brown Bag, we miss you, and so it's nice to see our group back together. I do want to reinforce we thank you so much to First Bank of Alabama. Mr. Chris, thank you for always being here and being such a great representative. Please make sure if you see anybody from the bank to thank them for their support. The Cookies, Coosa Valley Medical Center, and the Hickory Street Cafe, y'all know how much we love them. So please make sure you thank them for their support. Miss Jane, for coming and being such a gracious hostess. And I want to thank Dr. Shirley Spears in the back. Dr. Spears works with the Library Foundation, and she books these great programs for us. And it's nice to have a new face, and we hope to have Dr. Downs back. So thank you, Dr. Spears. And thank you so much for coming. We were just telling Dr. Downs about a, a program that, that Sarah had to do yesterday for Rotary Club and she had two pictures in the PowerPoint presentation and one picture was showing the room that we used to do the brown bag program in which was upstairs years ago if you remember that. The room was a lot smaller and the
and the room was packed. And then she showed a picture of this auditorium with a packed crowd in here as well. And what we thought was so interesting was Dr. Wayne Flint was the presenter in both of those pictures almost 30 years apart. So thank you for coming because people like Dr. Flint, people like Dr. Downs, they come to Sylacauga because you've continued to support this program through the years. So thank you so much. Next week, we have Catherine Braun. If you've been here before, you know she is an expert in Native American history, and she's going to do a great program on the travels of William Bertram. So thank you all for coming, and we'll see you again next week.